All right, if you have a Bible still open, uh, flip first to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. When you find that spot, I want you to hold it. Find Genesis 16, hold that, and then I want you to flip a few books to the right to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and then move backwards to Genesis 16. The, the topic today is about uh, pregnancy and childbirth, and um, I mean, I guess a lot of you know Kelly and I are pregnant. We're two months shy of the due date, and uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, Kelly had a little scare where it looked like we might be going into labor quite early, and so we were in the hospital for about four days, which is the longest I've ever been in the hospital for anything. And uh, we, uh, Kelly, was put on something called magnesium. Maybe some of you have experienced this. Not a, not a fun thing through an IV, and um, she's doing much better. Jared preached last week. If you get a chance, go back on the podcast and listen. He preached on Romans 8, 28, and it was a great comfort for me personally, uh, knowing that God works all things together for good for his people. But I had two weeks to think through this strange story that most people probably want to skip. In fact, part of me wanted to skip it. Uh, Hagar and Ishmael and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and those characters, and what do you do with this story? And I've just been thinking about it a lot over the last couple weeks, and to kind of give a setting here to what's going on and what this culture was like, uh, I want to read another story that's similar. Uh, so I'm, I hope you're ready. We're going to read a lot of Bible today. So I hope you're Bible, Bible-loving people, because we're going to be reading a lot of, a lot of verses here. So uh, strap in. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we will get to work. God, I was just convicted um, this week, I was convicted this morning from these texts that um, when we try to produce fruit and results in our own strength, trusting in ourselves, it leads to destruction. And that the miracles we want to happen are just that, they're miracles of the Holy Spirit. Conversion is not something we can manipulate into existence. Spiritual growth is not something that we can simply administrate and cause to happen by our own strength in the flesh. But if we want to see people want to Christ, if we want to see ourselves passionate about you, that has to come from the Spirit. And so Holy Spirit, we, we, we really are desperate for you to come right now and throughout this service and to Move mildly, because if you don't move, nothing of any lasting significance will happen. So I pray, God, that you will do more than we ask or imagine, even during this service, more than we think you're going to do, more than we're even prepared for you to do through your word, that you would warm our affections, you'd break us over our sin, that you would give us great faith to trust your promises, and that you would teach us something about the gospel of Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you remember... God has chosen Abram. I'm going to call him Abraham from now on. Okay, he gets a name change in chapter 17 from Abram to Abraham and his wife from Sarai to Sarah. I'm just going to call them Abraham and Sarah to spare the confusion. Abraham is chosen by God, and God says, I am going to restore what was lost in Eden through your family. I'm going to bless the world through your family. And Abram says, That's great, but I don't have a family. <laughs> I'm married. But we don't have any kids, and I don't know if you've noticed, but we're in our 70s, and then they were in their 80s, and they still don't have any kids. And so, 10 years after God has made this promise to give him a family and an offspring and a seed that's going to restore the blessing of Eden to the whole world, they're still childless. Just try to feel this for a second. Try, and so often we think of these biblical characters like they float like six inches over, up above the ground, like they're not even real people. Abraham and Sarah were very real and very flawed, and yet great people. But they had some major flaws, and they're, they're trying to figure this out. God has made a promise that we're going to have a child, and that he, God's going to bless the nations through our offspring. Where is he? We're not getting any younger here. Where is our son? And they're waiting. And imagine 10 years going by to where Abraham reaches his late 80s, and they still are not pregnant. So that's we're going to get there in just a minute. I want to read a, a story that parallels that um, of the birth of Samuel. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the first verse mentions uh, Hannah's husband, whose name was Elkanah. Let's look at verse 2. Elkanah had two wives. You're like, what? Excuse me? Uh, yeah, let me just, every time polygamy comes up, you've got to stop and talk about it. So real quick, 
Uh, polygamy is something that, that is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. That's true. And people love to throw this at Christians and say, come on, how can you possibly believe this outdated, dusty book where polygamy is all over the place? I want to make this very clear. If you've ever had a college professor say this to you, that how can you trust the Bible? It, 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 it promotes polygamy. Well, if you've actually read the Old Testament, you will realize that it never promotes polygamy. If you read the Old Testament, you'll actually find out it tells you everything that can possibly go wrong if you practice polygamy. Most of the problems in the Old Testament, I'm not even kidding, a large number of the problems that happen in the Old Testament happen as a result of the family drama that comes from polygamy. So if you, if you look at this, for instance, the turning point in Old Testament history, when everything was looking great, David had passed his kingdom on to his great son Solomon. I mean, Solomon, he was the richest, wealthiest man who has ever lived. He, Bill Gates is put to shame by Solomon's wealth. It was, he was so wealthy that silver was treated like gravel in Jerusalem. Just try to picture that level of wealth. It was like, no, oh, silver, that's, that's, get that out of here. I need my gold. Golden jewels only, no silver. And so he was that wealthy. And he builds this gigantic temple. And then it says, 1 Kings chapter 11 and 12 tells you the turning point of the Old Testament. That the most sad part, in many ways, one of the saddest parts of the Old Testament, it says Solomon married many wives. And his heart was led astray from the Lord. And that is the fall of Solomon, which led to the kingdom being split in half from a civil war, and it led to major death and destruction, and the kingdom falling apart. So the Bible's not promoting polygamy. When Jesus was asked about marriage in Matthew 19, he said, it was not so from the beginning. In the beginning, God made them one man and one woman, male and female, from the beginning he created them and coveted them together. It wasn't uh, Adam and Eve and another woman. It was Adam and Eve. And that's the paradigm, that's the blueprint for marriage that Jesus and the Apostle Paul used in the New Testament and what the Old Testament people should have used as their paradigm. So the Bible is not promoting polygamy. It shows you actually all the problems that come if you practice polygamy. And I, I end my footnote. Let's keep moving. Verse 2. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Anna had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at, Sh at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, bad guys, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Benina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah. He gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, you see what polygamy does? And her rival, the other wife, uh, used to provoke her grievously and to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Just hang on here. We have lessons to learn from this woman. She has a multi-year long grief, the inability for her to have children. And what does she do? She is deeply distressed and she's taking that where? To the Lord. Remember Abraham in chapter 15? He took his grief and his, his anxiety to the Lord. Here she is pouring out her heart to the Lord. I'm telling you, if we can learn this one thing, it will change, it'll change our lives. If we can learn to take our negative emotions to the Lord in prayer, it will change our lives. I'm not, that's not, uh, I'm not trying to sell you something right now. That's true. If we can learn to take our resentment and jealousy and anger and fear and anxiety and pour it out to the Lord boldly before the throne of grace and have ourselves process our disordered loves before God's throne, it would change our lives. That's what she does. Verse 11. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. That's a reference to the Nazarite vow. Well, listen to this. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, that's the priest, observed her mouth. She's in the temple. She's at church. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. 
And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. You see this? When we pour out our complaint before the Lord, we walk away and her face is no longer sad. I mean, it's not hard for us to pour out our complaint to friends, to pour out our complaints to people we know, family members. I mean, we can, we can rant all day long to people in our lives about everything that bothers us. And that's not hard, is it? To have a rant session? Here's why I'm angry right now. And you just pour it out. And there's a place for that. But we need to learn to, to turn that into prayer. Turn that into prayer. And she leaves no longer sad because the Lord was working in her heart. And look at verse 19. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. It's a beautiful story. Now flip with me back to Genesis 16. What we just saw was a great example of what Abraham and Sarah should have done. They should have relentlessly poured out their complaint to the Lord, pled with God to answer the prayer and to grant them a son. But instead, they did what we all are tempted to do, which is to take matters into our own hands. And here is what happens Verse 1 of Genesis 16. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Let's pause here. In this culture and in this society, uh, I'll just say this because this is true. Uh, the, the belief was that very much, very often, a woman's worth was tied very closely to how many children she could have and how her children turned out. Okay, This was like a cultural thing pressed down on the society saying, if you can have a lot of children, they turn out really well, you have more worth, you have more value. And this is why the two wives of Elkanah treated each other half with irritation and contempt. And so Sarai is buying into this line that the culture has given, which is saying your worth is bound up in what you can produce here. And this is what she decides to do. This was a common practice. Middle of verse 1. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. I had not noticed this, I don't know how I missed this, but the same language of Genesis 3 is used. Because you listen to the voice of your wife and she took and gave to her husband. It's the same exact words for what Eve did. She took the fruit and gave to her husband. Here, Sarah takes Hagar and gives to the husband. So it's just showing you this is about to be a bad moment. That's all it's telling. It's kind of remembering the fall. This is going to be something bad's about to happen here. And he sleeps with Hagar, marries her, sleeps with her, and she conceives. Verse 4. He went to Hagar and she conceived. And when Hagar saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Okay, stop here. The culture assigns men and women, children, adults, it, it assigns us all areas in which if we succeed, we have value and worth. And if we fail, we are not as valued, not as, not as worthwhile. This is this area where it's saying children is the capital that a woman has. This is, this is her value. This is what gives her a sense of purpose and worth. That's what the culture was saying. And so when uh, Hagar gets pregnant, she's not just excited about having a baby. See, it's not just that she gets to have a baby. She is seeing her child as actually giving her status in the family. You see how different that is from just celebrating a child? 
She's not just celebrating that she has a, that she's pregnant. She's actually using her pregnancy to say, I'm better than you, Sarah. So whatever we try to find our worth and our identity in, if we succeed in that thing, we will look with contempt on those we see as failures. So, for instance, Jesus tells a parable. I'm going to give this a religious context. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 18, starting in verse 9, where he says, Jesus, it says, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and therefore treated others with contempt. Same word here, right? Treated others with contempt. And Jesus says, the Pharisees thought they were more worthy before God because of their tithing and their fasting and their memorization of Scripture and all their virtuous deeds. They thought they were actually more worthwhile, more valuable, more righteous in God's sight than the tax collectors and the sinners. And Jesus says, therefore, they treated them with contempt. Whatever we find our identity and worth in outside of Jesus, if we succeed in that thing, we will look on the failures around us, those we deem as failures, as just that, and we will treat them with contempt, like they're beneath us. And you, you can't, you cannot love people you feel superior to, okay? So I'm saying this to, we're talking to church people, okay? We have a reputation, I don't know if you know about this, for feeling superior to other people. Why do church people have the reputation of feeling superior to non-church people? Because we're not finding our identity in the gospel, but in ourselves, we're thinking because I memorize scripture, because I go to a Bible study or lead a Bible study or whatever I do, because of my virtuous deeds, I tithe, I, I give, I help people out, I do the right thing. Because I'm so much better than so-and-so, I look on them with contempt. And that's the reputation we as church people have inherited because of how poorly religious people do this. We are not to find our reputation in our accomplishments or in our failures, but in Jesus' success and accomplishments for us. In the gospel alone is it safe to find our identity, where it is unthreatened and untouched. And you can't really brag about an identity that was given to you. You can brag if you earn it, but you can't brag if it was a gift. You can't brag over a gift like Christ's righteousness. Verse 5, here's Sarah's reaction. And Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. So she said, Abram, you should have done something about this. She's treating me horribly. You should have done something. Verse 6. Abram is just a total whip at this moment. I hate to say that, but he, he is. A Abraham said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Terrible piece of advice. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. Okay. Hagar is an Egyptian woman, and she was most likely heading back to Egypt. This is a long journey, and she's into a pre she's part of into a pregnancy to know she's pregnant, and that doesn't become public. So she's a, a pregnant woman, and she's so desperate right now, being treated so poorly by Sarah, that she's actually walking, probably, trying to get back to Egypt. I mean, this is... She, Many people think she had traveled at least 70 miles at this point, over a course perhaps of a week or more, walking, okay? And the Lord is showing mercy to her. He shows up at verse 8. He said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. This is the only example in the whole Bible where someone names God. It's amazing. Hagar is the only person in the Bible to give God a title. And she calls him the God of seeing because he is looking after her in this moment of desperation and she's been treated horribly and of need. Why does Sarah fly off the handles at Hagar? Well, if you have an idol, in her case it was having this child, 
and someone else achieves the idol and you fail to achieve your idol, there is going to be intense passion and anger and emotion that boils up and she just kind of lets her have it and it was not righteous, it wasn't good, and she treats her poorly. Now again, let me try to correct something else that may be going on in our minds as we read this. If you think the Bible is mainly, if you think this book is mainly a bunch of like Aesop's fables, remember Aesop's fables? A bunch of morality lessons? You're going to be very confused reading the Old Testament. Because we tend, to, I mean, we tend to think of it like this. There's a bunch of stories of characters who behave well, and you should behave well like them. What would Abraham do? Well, he would do something you shouldn't do. <laughs> what, what, would, what would Samson do? You don't want to follow him. Uh, we, we look at the biblical characters. They are greatly flawed men and women. I mean, right? Greatly flawed men and women. The Bible is, Genesis is not written mainly to give you a bunch of narratives of how you're supposed to act. Um, the Bible is mainly, the book of Genesis is mainly showing you a God who is faithful to his promise, even when it looks like every human being is doing everything they can to ruin it, to spoil it, right? And so the, 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 when we read the Bible, yes, it is supposed to make us obedient, but not mainly just by following flawed people's examples that are imperfect. The main thing we're doing is we're saying, wow, God is keeping his promise to Abraham no matter what his people do wrong. That's why. So the, the purpose of the Old Testament is to go, the God of Israel, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps His word. He keeps His promise. He never lies. He never forsakes His word. You can trust Him no matter what the circumstances look like. No matter what anyone else has done to ruin the plan, God will work it out for good. He is not going to lie to you. And so, in Genesis, you see people trying to ruin the plan. The serpent in the, world, in the garden is trying to ruin God's plan. God overcomes with His word. Everyone throughout the Old Testament is trying to ruin God's plan. And God says, I don't care what anyone does right or wrong. My word will stand. I will accomplish everything that goes wrong. And the ultimate example of that is the cross. Because in the moment of Christ's death, it seemed like Satan had actually won. Because the, de the devil entered Judas to betray Jesus. Jesus said in Luke that this is the hour of the power of darkness. This is Satan's hour to shine. And he, Satan has Jesus murdered and buried. And you go, story's over. We lost. Our Savior is dead. It's over. Nothing good can come from this. And God goes, I am, I am the God who turns the evil and sin and wickedness of people against them. And I actually make evil and Satan commit suicide through their own doings. And the cross is the ultimate example. Sin and Satan did their worst to ruin God's plan. And in so doing, they actually fulfilled God's plan. So trying to ruin God's word, they fulfilled God's word, not even knowing when that's what they were doing. Does that make sense? And so God, the, the point of the Bible is not read a bunch of morality lessons like Aesop's fables and try to be just like all those characters. Because if you do, you'll be a polygamist committing adultery. If you just try to do what all the characters do in the Old Testament, you'll be doing some bad stuff. Abraham lies to Pharaoh in chapter 12. He lies to King Abimelech in chapter 20. He's not perfect. Noah, remember the whole drunken thing in Noah's story? You don't want to be just like him. The, per the point is, even in the midst of people's failures, God keeps His word. And so we should have faith in the God who keeps His promises, no matter what's happening in our lives. Amen? That's, that's the point. So as you read this, this is about God keeping His word, but it, the situation looks very bleak. Alright, verse 15. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Just a quick little history lessons. I'm sure many of you know this already. Ishmael ends up having descendants who go on for a while, and they form the Arabs. And from Ishmael's genealogical line, a guy named Muhammad shows up in the late 500s AD. And Muhammad is a, most likely a physical descendant directly from Ishmael. And he actually claims in the Quran... Uh, this is one of the big, one of the major, there's many major kind of differences, but there's a huge difference between Christianity and Islam at this point in particular. Uh, Islam teaches that the, the promised son of Abraham is not Isaac, but Ishmael. And they, really this point makes the difference between night and day. I mean, this is a huge difference. At Genesis 22, when Abraham offers up Isaac on the altar and then God stops him, we'll get to that soon, it's one of my favorite texts in Genesis. But the, 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 the Islamic people would say that that was actually Ishmael. So they, they claim Ishmael's line leads to Muhammad. That's the legitimate heirs of, of Christ. Uh, not of Christ, of, of God. But um, Scripture clearly teaches know that this is actually Isaac. And that's, that's where the Jewish people descend from. So think about this. Think about all the friction and tension in the Middle East. 
between a couple different groups of people that's been lasting for over 2,000 years. I'm not even kidding you. The, the origination of that is Abraham sleeping with Satan, with Hagar. But all that, a lot of the tension and friction and, and a lot of the violence in the Middle East is, is ultimately owing back 4,000 years to Abraham making a giant mistake. So again, we don't want to imitate Abraham in this, but God, even through that, keeps his promise. Look at 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99, so 13 years have passed, and Ishmael is now 13 years old. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me, be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Skip ahead to verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. Pause. We know this is coming in the text because we've read this. Abraham does not know that's coming next. As far as Abraham knows, I'm convinced. He thinks Ishmael is going to be the child of promise. I I'm convinced of this. A and he's sitting there going, okay, Ishmael, he's pouring his life at Ishmael, going, you're the promised son. God's going to bless us through Ishmael. And God hasn't necessarily told him otherwise. And right here he goes, Sarah's going to have a child. And Abram starts to laugh. <laughs> do, you, do you know how old we are? No, that's not possible. But God goes, no, it's going to be through Sarah. Look, he goes, I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Do you see it? Who does Abram want as the, as the son? Ishmael. He says, God, let Ishmael be the child. He's already here. He's 13. My wife is 90. We can't have kids. This is not going to happen. Let Ishmael live before you. Let Ishmael be the child of promise. And this is what God says. God says, I am not going to let the works of, what, of your flesh and what you can muster up on your own be the way I fulfill my promise. I'm going to fulfill my promise through a miracle that only I can do. Okay. We're going to leave this text and go to the New Testament. We're not coming back, so go to, go to Galatians in the New Testament, chapter 4. Galatians, chapter 4. The end of the chapter, verses, uh, verse 21. Paul picks up on that story we just read over about 2,000 years after it's happened. And this is what he says to the Galatians. Galatians 4.21 Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now do you see the difference? Born according to the flesh is you doing what you can do in your own strength. Born through promise is God doing what only God can do. That's the difference between the two verses. Verse 24. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. So Paul's going to use this as an allegory. These women are like two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is like Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. All right, probably a little, uh, it's a little confusing. <laughs> Here, here's what's going on. 
Paul says, I see an analogy, an allegory between the story that we just read and what's going on with Pharisees and the gospel. He says, listen to this. Abraham had two sons, one from a slave. So Abraham said, in my flesh, in my own strength, I'm going to have a child. And that son, because he's born to Hagar, inherited slavery. He was born as a slave. And Paul says, I mean, Paul says, listen, if, if you tell people to live under the law, which means their acceptance before God is based on their moral record, their moral performance. They're trying to earn their identity, earn their righteousness, earn their way to God. He says that is a form of what? Slavery. If you're trying to earn your, your acceptance before God, it's like slavery. It's, it's like being on a treadmill. And the treadmill keeps getting faster and faster and faster. You've got to keep all these commands. All these commands. 613 commands in the Old Covenant. And so you're running as fast as you can. You're exerting all the effort you can exert. And eventually, you're going to probably fall over and collapse in this thing and destroy yourself. But even if you do the best you can, you're not making any forward progress. And another example would be, you guys ever remember this, the, the, the uh, plate splitting, uh, excuse me, the plate spinning act. Remember this thing? The guy would have a bunch of sticks, and he'd put a plate, and he'd start spinning it. And he'd put a second one up, he'd start spinning it. He'd move to the third, he'd go back to the first one, because it's getting wobbly, and he'd start, and he's moving around. And he's got like six plates spinning, and then he's got seven. He's going back to the first one, trying to get that one back again. And he's running all over the stage, breaking a sweat, trying to keep all these plates spinning, and he keeps adding plates. Living under God's law, trying to base your acceptance with God on the law, is like that. You're like, okay, I'm supposed to do some evangelism this week. Okay, I'm going to do some evangelism. Supposed to have my quiet time every day, I'm doing my quiet time. Okay, I'm supposed to go to a Bible study. I'm going to three Bible studies. I'm going to put three plates up over here. And you're, we're running all over the place trying to perform for God. And in the end, you end up totally exhausted. And it becomes a form of slavery. And Paul says that the current Jerusalem, where the Pharisees had control, was giving birth to slaves, just like Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, who was a slave. You get that? He's saying if you put people under the law to earn their way to God by doing and not doing certain commandments, it is slavery. It, it motivates you by fear and pride. You never feel like God is accepted, accepting you or happy with you. And you work, 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 and you, you just feel enslaved. And Paul says, that is bad news. He says, but the Jerusalem above is free. The gospel produces freedom. Verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, talking to Christians, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But the slave woman and her son, excuse me, but what does scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So the brother, so brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Okay, I want to zero in real quick on verse 29. Verse 28, he says, You brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. Okay. Um... There are two ways that people can try to be Christians, essentially, to become Christians. One is according to the flesh, and one is according to the Spirit. According to the flesh, according to the Spirit. It is very easy um, to try to manipulate people into becoming Christians through kind of coercive means and almost emotional trickery and trying to kind of get people in the door. And sometimes it can create false conversions, conversions of the flesh, just trying to kind of do your thing. Um, we've all been in settings where, you know, you wonder if the amount of people say they became a Christian that night really became a Christian that night, right? When like 375 people became Christians out of 400, you're like, I don't know that that's right. I mean, I would like to believe that, but I'm just not sure. Uh, that can be according to the flesh, done just by our own efforts and trying to get things done. But Paul says, if we want to see real conversion and growth, it has to be something that happens according to the Spirit. Which means it can't be something that we manipulate, that we force into, it, into action. But what I think that should make us do is become people who pray. Because ultimately, 
fruit happening in this church, fruit happening in your life, fruit happening in the people around you, can't happen by a trick. It can't happen by hype. It can't happen by emotional manipulation. It has to happen by the Holy Spirit as a miraculous thing, a child of promise, or it's not really happening. And so the, the thing that was really on me last night and this morning was, was the idea of prayer, that we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. And I know this is so basic, but I, I think it's about as important as it gets. We need to pray and plead for the Holy Spirit to move on us, on me, so that I want to do evangelism not so I can spit a plate to impress God, but because I'm so enthralled by the beauty of what Jesus has done for me that I have to tell somebody. But do you see how different those two things are? One is out of fear, like, I'm a terrible Christian if I don't evangelize. I better evangelize. Oh gosh, I better evangelize. And it's just, you know how perfunctory and dutiful it just doesn't feel like it's coming out of the heart of, of joy. Whereas, if you see a movie that you love, how hard is it to tell someone else they should see that movie? It's not that hard. If you actually are thrilled by the thing, it is second nature to talk about it. You have a baby, you start talking about it. You're thrilled about it. You're, you're talking about it. You're telling people about the, the new baby. I want Jesus to be for us that. Where we're so moved and affected by what Christ has done that we tell people, that we talk about Him. The song that we're going to sing in just a moment has this rock of ages, has this famous verse. It says, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the, the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And he says, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. I want us to confess our own helplessness. To save ourselves, to transform ourselves, and to plead with God to come down in the power of His Spirit and to work in our heart to reorder what's wrong so that we talk about Him, we praise Him, we confess Him out of joy and not just out of pride or out of fear. Let's pray. God, I pray as we sing that you would show us how great the good news is, how freeing it is. It is not a yoke of slavery that oppresses us and depresses us, but it is freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. I pray that we would not be motivated to obey out of a desire to earn our way into heaven, or out of a fear merely of hell, but out of a joy and a delight and an excitement about who Christ is and what Christ has done. I think that we don't have to earn our identity or earn our religious righteousness because in Christ we have all the righteousness we could ever need. And I pray we can celebrate that now. In Jesus' name, amen.